understood everything that Richard said because it's hugely relevant to what I was hope, hoping to say as well, which means Matt Butler's done an excellent job of integrating the papers. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the story of sphagnum in the South Pennines, which includes the Peak District. Um, starting uh, just some, with some quotes, actually. 1913, Charles Moss wrote a book about the vegetation of the Peak District, which is a brilliant book if you want to read it. Described the moorlands as the cotton grass moors are extensive, dreary and monotonous. One may walk many miles over the moors of this district without seeing any trace of sphagnum, and the, the picture behind it is one of those, and that was only taken a year or so ago. Hare's tail cotton grass is frequently the only vascular plant which occurs, um, which was a bit depressing, really, um, and he wasn't that enthusiastic about it. And there's quite a lot of evidence that uh, quite a few of the species that you would feel characteristic of blanket bog, like those listed there, uh, have actually reduced some of the old floras show them in, back in the 1800s show them as being much more abundant than they are now. Um, but if you go back to 1815, somebody called Fari actually wrote a book about uh, the agriculture and minerals of Derbyshire, which included a large part of the Peak District, and he described these upland mosses as formed of great accumulation of grey bog mosses, and he gives one species, there may have been others, common cotton grass, marsh horsetail, which is an interesting one, we think that's probably hare's tail, because there's no horsetails up there now, even if they were in the Carboniferous period, um, heaths, rusher bents, and other small aquatic plants. But I love this bit about the most black and rotten of these elevated peat mosses. Now, that's only 100, 100 or so years ago from um, mosses descriptions, a couple of hundred years ago from now. So what has been the history of sphagnum in the South Pennines and the Peak District? And we have to thank John Tallis from Manchester University from a, a lifetime of research, relevant research, particularly into this area and into its history of what um, was developing in the, in the peat. And he suggests that until about 1300 AD, sphagnum was actually quite abundant or dominant in the blanket bogs. And the hummock, hollow, ridge pool surface patterning, the sort of thing that Richard showed in that last picture. And if you read Richard's book on the, the carbon, your carbon tome, there's lots of lovely little pictures of that sort of thing. Um, but that was actually developed about 2,000 years ago. So we did have abundant sphagnum at times in the Peak District. But following about 1300, there was a change where sphagnum abundance, still there, declined, and hair's tail cotton grass became more abundant. And there's a couple of things happening at that time, not clear about the relationships and which one might be more important or, or more important than the other, and probably all of them had an effect. One was that more significant charcoal uh, profiles were found in the peat profiles at that time, and there was more regular burning suggested from the 14th century onwards, although burning of the moorlands in the peat district certainly goes back to the Mesolithic, um, that includes Boland, the South Pennine area as well, um, where people were, were burning and trying to encourage um, grazing animals to concentrate in one place so they could actually catch them. Um, and, but there's also the potential for some climate change because climate has fluctuated. And there was the Little Ice Age between 1500 and 1850 or thereabouts, which was wetter and colder than it is now, which might have initiated more erosion. And certainly some of the gullies, the main uh, gullies in the Peak District in the Peat, um, John Tallis reckons were something like four to five hundred years old. And gullying seems to have started at different times in different parts of the country. So some, some of the ones in Scotland are an awful lot older, for example. Um, but then you have to start thinking about, well, what was the human interference which actually resulted in the sort of descriptions I've just given you by Charles Moss? And we can look at a whole range of factors that have had some impact, but we're not necessarily clear because many of them happened at the same time the relevant importance of each of, um, in terms of, of where has all the sphagnum gone. So first you might want to talk about grazing. Now, sheep don't graze sphagnum, they don't eat it, but they do pull it up. And the picture I showed you there is again only taken a couple of years ago of a particularly good piece, in inverted commas, um, of blanket bog where the sheep were actually pulling up the hare's tail cotton grass, and I think that's high desperation. This is on a very overstocked common, and I won't tell you where just at the moment, um, and where there's really no chance for sphagnum to survive under those sorts of trampling and sort of pulling out what they don't want to get at what they do want sort of uh, situation. Um, but uh, again, Tallis suggests that um, the grazing levels of sheep, at least up to the 1930s, 
was very much the same from about 1550 onwards. And certainly Dave Shimwell has also shown that sheep grazing in the Edal area was at the same sort of level with all the importance of the Cistercian monasteries, uh, monasteries on those moorland areas um, way back in the 1700s. Um, um, then J uh, Derek Yalden, whom we sadly miss now, um, was showing that since the 1930s, sheep stock numbers in the parishes that contain the moorlands in the Peak District in particular had increased threefold, much reduced now from the ESA and, and agri-environment schemes. So some species might be more sensitive to grazing because of this pulling out and trampling effect um, rather than actually grazing itself. But I have seen sites, and there are examples here, um, where there's really not much chance for sphagnum at all. The, my left, is it your left? Yes. <laughs> the left-hand picture at the top is actually a case in Mayo. And all those little hummocks are the remains of hummocks from, uh, from a hummock hollow system. You've seen it, presumably, Richard. Um, and this was their last gasp. If they hadn't got the sheep off then, then that lot would have actually decayed into erosion. The one on the right-hand side at the top is actually heavy cattle grazing on cotton grass bog where there was very little sphagnum, a lot of water, a lot of space, a lot of uh, poaching. And the one at the bottom is rather decrepit millennia, thankfully now recovered, which was heavily grazed and burnt, not a speck of sphagnum in that either. So let's move on to managed burning. What sort of um, impact might that have had? And again, um, I just wanted to, to, to read a... Um, an extract again from Fari, 1815, but writing about the end of the 1700s. This is the Peak District, and this is particularly about an, a site west of Stanage Moss. It says, The firing of the heath in dry weather had at different periods set fire to the peat, and into which it had continued to penetrate and make large and irregular holes. Back to holes again, Richard. This source of unevenness of the gruffs and gullies and the local dead black places on the surface of these mosses is perhaps more common than has been supposed late 1700s. So that suggests that some of the gullying um, was derived from some of the collapsing of, and of fire penetrating underground, which it can do very easily. Um, there was much more controlled burning, again indi indicated by the charcoal levels in the, the peat profiles that John Tallis uh, um, researched from about 1800 onwards. But that burning might have been quite different then because it was the Grass Commission in 1911 that actually set up the idea of much smaller scale burning of the sort that you see now for grass moor management. And certainly, again, Fari described shepherds going out for the day just burning large areas, which was essentially for sheep. Um, burning certainly seems to increase the dominance of hare's tail cotton grass and heather, uh, and certainly there are some species like tenellum, for example, or sphagnum, which are quite sensitive to burning. Now, the other thing is, though, that regular burning actually has an impact on the surface and land on the peat. It can dry it out. Um, it can actually increase the nutrients temporarily. It, it also produces water-repellent bitumens and tars, which form a skin, which means that after burning, when it rains, and sometimes it might burn, rain very heavily, like the storm we had yesterday, then that will pour off that site um, rather than actually penetrate into the ground. And some uh, work by Joe Holden at Leeds University suggests that there's many more peat pipes under um, blanket bog, heather dominated, which is regularly burnt. So is it, and then, more susceptible to erosion and a reduced water table. The picture I've put at the bottom there is a site that we've looked at recently, and there's a number of these um, in the eastern side of the Peak District, where what I'm calling gutter has, are starting to develop. All of those little holes are actually something like 6, 12 inches deep, some of them. They are gutter, like a house gutter type size and shape, very irregular, join up, and you can actually see how if you burnt that surface, and remembering then that oxen will be drawn into those holes, you could actually make them bigger quite quickly. And this is managed burning that, that on this site. That man and managed burning I have seen also hot enough in the past at least to destroy cotton grass tussocks. Sphagnum hasn't then got very much of a chance. But I think that probably one of the major culprits rather than managed burning, that I think that will contribute but in a less dramatic way perhaps than wildfire. Now, Thinking about the South Pennines and its position in the peatland of the country, we're at the driest part of, um, or, you know, you, you come off our moors and you go south. We're the first moor, moorland areas that you come to from the south and the east. Um, so it's drier compared with a lot of other areas of the country. 
And wildfires have been significant, not just recently. The figures I give you there were um, collating the data from 1970 to 1995. And you can see a very significant number of fires and also a very close relationship uh, with where people are. And an awful lot of fires, and this is on southern heathlands as well, are arson or carelessness um, rather than anything else. And you can sort of see also the area some of these fires can cover. Now, a fire, a wildfire, is particularly damaging if it's hot, if it's slow, if it back burns, which means going back against the wind, because then it gets much hotter, and destroys not only the vegetation but the root mat as well. If it just goes quickly over the surface of the vegetation, it's more like a managed fire, and that can actually be covered relatively quickly, although it could still affect the sphagnum. But one of the real problems is when it destroys it all, and then it exposes <coughs> that peat to erosion. And if you, and some of you are old enough to remember 1976, there's an awful lot of you who aren't, <coughs> We had the wettest September at that time, probably exceeded since then, on record after the, a really long 1975-76 drought. And there is a moorland in the Peak District which was burnt in 1976 and then lost a metre of peat in that September, just like that. And some examples of the effect of a fire on vegetation. The top left-hand picture is actually a sphagnum little hummock which was burnt. This is a site in Northern Ireland. If you look at the bottom right, though, can you see all those little brown blobs on there and, the, and a line? The line across the middle is actually a fire, so you've had a recent fire on the southern um, part of that, the lower part of that site, which is southern, actually. All of those blobs look like, on close up, the picture at the top right. So when it's wet, they're full of water. When it's dry, they're not. They're not pools. They're not bog pools. They haven't got sphagnum in them at all. There's no sphagnum up there, really, or there wasn't much at all. And the one at the bottom left is what happens then when the, um, they dry out, but then you can see little rills starting to develop. Now, my suggestion is that those will then actually eventually develop into, because of rain and because there's no sphagnum there, because there's no vegetation there, because the grazing is too high, all of these interactions of the effects, you're going to get deep, deeper gullies developing. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And so some of our deeper gullies um, and, um, have developed in the Peak District, I think, as a product probably of wildfire. And the fact that we have got hundreds of gullies, Peak District and the South Pennines, and a lot of them close together means that your water table is going to drop. Because if you've got a large area of peat, your water table's got space to rise and drop down at the sides. But if you're going up and down, up and down, up and down, anybody walked across Kinder Scout and up and down, up and down, then you haven't got space for that water table to rise up to the surface before uh, you meet the next gully. The other thing that I think that Joe Holden hasn't shown, but I think he would show if he did the research with ground penetrating radar, is if you see those two right-hand photographs, is that there seem to me to be a huge number, a high concentration of peak pipes associated with areas which have been regularly damaged by wildfire with intense gullying. And basically a peak pipe is a water that is just oozing out either underneath the catatelm, but more normally in the peak district at the bottom of the peak the surface with the mineral soil and then it collapses so that bottom one is a swallow hole basically but presumably the water was rushing through at the bottom the peat's collapsing around it it's going to get bigger and that water is going to be a pipe beyond it and below it and you can see the sort of extent of gullying and Matt this is one of the pictures of the area on the top right that you have now restored it doesn't look like that anymore but it, uh, it did and you can see again on the left hand side um, some of the extent of gullying and the the pinkness of the heather actually on the drier parts of that gully going back up into the core blanket bog and rather like um, the picture that Chris showed earlier what happens when you've got no peat left at all at the bottom. Now one of the things, I'm sorry about the quality of this, I tried photographing it and I tried scanning it, it didn't really work, but the, the uh, map on the right hand side, um, back in 1979-80 the Peak District National Park and partners started the Moreland Management Project, it started off as a Moreland Restoration Project seeking to find out much more about the extent of moorland uh, degradation in the Peak District, uh, principally after the North York Moors started after the 1976 fires doing something similar. And the map here actually shows the extent of gullying which was reconstructed by John Tallis uh, from the 18th century, which is the top little right-hand uh, map, and then what it was then at the time from the 1990s. And you can actually see the gullying has gone much further back up into what had been intact blanket bog, and it had also got much more intensive. And it's this intensification of the gullying which really doesn't give um, holding water much of a chance, compared, um, added on to all of these other factors. And what it looks like, 
is the picture of the bottom left is what some of that actually looks like now. Um, another factor which has affected the abundance of sphagnum is perhaps drainage in the way that uh, Richard has just suggested. But in fact, drainage from gripping is actually quite a minor affair in the Peak District and the South Pennines. We're really not a wet enough part of the country to have it intensive like in the North Pennines. But what we have actually in quite a number of places, particularly on the edges, is what I think is potentially areas of blanket bog that have actually been requisitioned, if you like, for trying to grow crops. Um, maybe after the Second World War when there was big for victory, etc. And you can see quite clearly with the snow on the top, this very regular um, system, which is actually clay drains in that one. And in the bottom, can you actually also see where the rushes come down? That is a ridge between the two rushes. And that must have been ploughed at some time. We don't know where, when. And were these perhaps what's called lazy beds? I don't know. But the bottom one is now heavily grazed, no sphagnum, it's all common pasture herbs in it, but it's on peat. Peat extraction, although people don't think of our area as being a major area for peat extraction, it's certainly not the sort of scale that you can see in Ireland and parts of Scotland, but that top left photograph, if you can just pick out some of the, um, the small bulkheads of sphagnum with the wetter blanket bog in between, that's on top of the goit. I only noticed it actually the first time the other day. Richard has very kindly already introduced the issue of air pollution, and it's really air pollution in the last couple of hundred years which has been the major factor that has reduced or eliminated a lot of the sphagnum species in the Peak District. So instead of the left-hand picture, you've got more like the right-hand picture, and that isn't a bog pool, that's just a wet bit that I think has been burnt out. And um, we did a project for Moors of the Future where we actually assessed um, the, the situation in terms of sphagnum, and we looked at the air pollution, and some of these are taken from Jackie Carroll's report that was produced for uh, MF, MFF. And what it suggests here is that um, just trying to total the amount of sulphur that's been deposited on the black blanket bogs from 1880 to 1991, just look at the amount in the South Pennines compared with some of the other areas. And that was actually equivalent, I think she, she wrote, to actually putting one litre of concentrated sulphuric acid per metre square. That is, ex you know, that's pretty horrible stuff, which accounts for all the holes in my coat as well as blackbird probably as well. Um, but in the last 20-odd um, years in particular, the amounts of those pollutants, in particular sulphur, has gone down. So some data that Jackie provided here at the bottom right, and you can pick up the uh, blue line, that is the decline of sulphur dioxide, which is now below levels that have been found from research, John Lee, etc., to be sens uh, sensitive for, for sphagnum. Nitrogen going down less quickly. Um, so just to introduce a little bit about restoration, because then Matt will pick up more about the sphagnum. Restoration work on the moors really started by the North York moors after the 1976 fires. They had some dramatic fires and some dramatic losses of peat. The Peak District Mall and Mansion Project I've already mentioned. But what we, what we did then was to, actually using air photographs, was to uh, map and measure millimetre square graph paper. There was no GIS when, when we were doing that. Derek Yorn and Blessing did all that too. I, I mapped it, he measured it. Um, we had 6.5 kilometres of totally bare peat or mineral soil. More in the west and more at high altitude. And another 24.8 kilometres which was partly bare. So it was, it was likely to erode or it was mineral ground um, or it was, it was half and half. And they reckon the loss of peat into some of the reservoirs as well was something like 40 to 60 millimetres per year. But bearing in mind that is going to be a rush when you've had a major um, storm event rather than steady all the time. What the restoration project did then, though, was to focus not on hydrology so much, which it probably should have done, but revegetation. You had all this bare ground, so your immediate reaction is it is useless bare ground for everything, landscape, stock, wildlife, the lot. What can we do? And a whole series of different experiments over about 19 years on just what we could do. And there's a sequence here. You can see restoration using geojute, lime, fertiliser, um, and um, heather brash, with the cotton grass, etc., coming into that. And there's a very wide range of projects now all over the country. And I haven't put them all in. There's Dartmoors, Exmoor, um, Moors for Future, Yorkshire Peat Partnership, water companies, and so on. Um, and they are now much more focusing on re-wetting the moors um, because, basically, that damage from fire plus the air pollution, the loss of sphagnum, the loss of the hydrology that the sphagnum actually um, engenders in the moorlands, the gullying, the drying, means that our peat and our carbon is being lost at a rapid rate, uh, and our moorland is not a healthy moorland. 
So there's a variety of methods there used to try and um, restore the wetness. And at the same time, trying again to link some of these things together, the sphagnum's beginning to improve. The left-hand picture is one from our SCAMP project, which Sarah Ross has been managing, who's somewhere in the audience here, because I saw her. And that's her, so thank you, Sarah, that's your table. Um, but it's actually showing a significant increase in sphagnum in the plots which were drained, which is the two on the left and the one on the right, um, after simply gully block or drain blocking. That was an area where we did have some grips at the top of the goit. But at the same time, some of the work that's been done by Simon Kapoor, who you saw earlier, and at Al, um, showing that the, on the whole moss plots where, where um, sphagnum had actually been introduced um, had been resurveyed 20 odd years, 25 years later, 20 years later. And this is numbers of species, not percentage cover, so it does look quite dramatic. Um, all put more and whole moss. There's a significant increase in the number of sphagnum coming back because the sulfur dioxide levels are going down. And I'd actually just like to make a little quick plug because the sphagnum sort of coming back on the left-hand side, but there's other species that are appearing as well, which is actually quite interesting. The fir club moss, which has been extinct on the moors for quite some time, is appearing along the Pennine Way. So who's bringing it in? There's also creeping willow, the one on the right, that's also coming in, and that's a number of places. And there's royal fern. We haven't seen that on the moors for generations. Well, not that old, I suppose, but anyway. It's supposed to have been extinct on the moors for some time, so that's really nice. And this is, I think, the last one or thereabouts. Um, the work that Jackie did uh, for the Moors for Future Sphagnum Survey actually looked at um, sphagnum across a wide range of areas in the Peak District and compared them with Boland and some sites in the North Pennines and found that the current levels of nitrogen, sulfur and heavy metals were not actually preventing the sphagnum growth, but the pH values were still low. The lowest pH, I think, we've recorded, I've recorded about 2.8. You've found something lower, haven't you, or thereabouts in the past. And it is now creeping up to a sort of 3.23 or a bit more. So it is actually improving, but that's much slower than the reduction in sulfur dioxide. Um, they also found that there was a higher pH and moisture content at the North Pennine sites, which you might expect, A, because it's got a greater diversity of sphagnum, B, because it's a wetter site to start with. And it's essentially the legacy of that damage in the Peak District, which is um, part of the fact of preventing recovery here. So that was the last one. So that hopefully leads on to what Matt is going to be saying afterwards. Thank you very much. Indeed.